Epic of Gilgamesh. The epic tales of Gilgamesh that go back thousands of years, one of the oldest known transcripts of mankind. Ishtar. Ustra. Istra. Easter. Happy Easter. Isn't it funny how that cute little bunny pops around all over the place with those Chinese chocolate eggs? Now, I did some research about Easter, and it's funny because when you have religious people that worship on Easter as a day of the the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a lot of those people will ridicule others that don't have Christian beliefs. For example, I know many Christians that are good people that feel if you are pagan, that you are essentially a devil worshiper, and you're going to go to hell. And then some of those same people even realize that Easter (laughs) is based on a pagan holiday, or they think it's based on a pagan holiday. Because you can go back to Ustra, which is a Anglo-Saxon god, a Ger- uh, Germanic god, I should say. And let me go over this with you real quick. Ustra is a Germanic goddess who, by the way of Germanic month, bearing her name, is the namesake of the festival of Easter in some languages. Ustra is attested solely by Bede in the 8th century work, The Reckoning of Time, where Bede states that during Ustra, the equivalent of April, pagan Anglo-Saxons had held feasts in Ustra's honor, but that this tradition had died out by his name, I'm sorry, that this tradition had died out by his time, replaced by the Christian month, a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of people that already know, or at least feel that the the Christian religion adopted Easter to kind of usher in other people as well that may not be Christians to kind of create a kumbaya, a kumbaya effect multi-culture, you know, throw everything into a melting pot. If you can't beat them, just join them. That is many people's opinions of why Christians adopted Easter. Now, I'm going to take this a step further and say that Easter possibly isn't even really a pagan holiday. It goes back even before then, and this is what blew my mind. My mind was blown just again Or again, I should say. I mean, it gets blown all the time here with some of the guests that I talk to. Hello. Ustra. Easter. Now, obviously, Ustra is a fertility god. And let's go back into Ustra again here for a minute. The goddess named Ustra is therefore linguistically cognate with numerous other dawn goddesses attested among different language-speaking peoples. Now, these cognates lead to the reconstruction of a proto-Indo-European dawn goddess. The thing is, you can take this even further with Ishtar, the Sumerian god. Now, this goes back even further, the description of Easter. Easter is described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 6. I'm actually going to read the sixth tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it describes Ishtar, and this is where I feel we got the idea of Easter. Not from the pagans, not from a a cute bunny that's pooping out Chinese chocolate eggs that you then send your kids to go find as a little treat or a present. Now, Ishtar, described in the Epic of Gilgamesh, is pretty dark. I mean, it's pretty darn twisted. So, if this is a little bit too far out for you, or if you don't want to get into the underbelly of Easter religion, 
then this might not be for you and you might want to shut it off now. So look at the characteristics of Ishtar. Symbolizing love between human and animals. Interesting. It's power and it's danger. Ishtar was the daughter of Anu. She was particularly worshipped in the upper Mesopotamian kingdom of Assyria, northern Iraq. Now, one of the things also I find interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is Syria and the Sirius star constellation. Could there be a connection there? Is that where the Anunnaki came from? Well, besides the lions on her gate, her symbol is an eight-pointed star. In the Babylonian pantheon, she was the divine personification of the planet Venus. Ishtar had many lovers, however, as the grand notes. Woe to him whom Ishtar had honored. The fickle goddess treated her passing lovers cruelly, and the unhappy wretches usually paid dearly for their favors. Heaped on them, animals enslaved by love lost their native vigor. They fell into traps laid by men or were domesticated by them. Thou hast loved the lion. Mighty in strength, says the hero Gilgamesh to Ishtar. And thou hast dug for him seven and seven pits. Thou hast loved the steed proud in battle and destined him for the halter, the goad and the whip. Even for the gods Ishtar love was fatal. In her youth the goddess had loved Tammuz, god of the harvest, and if one is believe, if one is to believe Gilgamesh, this love caused the death of Tammuz. Now that's pretty wicked. So essentially, if you follow the narrative of Easter coming forth from Ishtar and the epic tells of Gilgamesh that describe Ishtar and how jealous. Ishtar is, and how she's willing to do anything to get what she wants. She even goes to her father, Anu, and threatens him, and says, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to open up the gates to hell. I'm going to rip open the gates of hell, and I'm going to bring forth the underworld unto the living, and there will be more dead among the living than the living. And I'm going to read that to you out of the Epic of Gilgamesh here in a minute. Now, her cult may have involved sacred prostitution, though this is debatable, Garan referred to her holy city, Uruk, as the town of the sacred and to her as the courtesan of the gods. Courtesan of the gods, I'm sorry. Courtesan of the gods. Now, the descent into the underworld. One of the most famous myths about Ishtar describes her descent to the underworld. In this myth, Ishtar approaches the gates of the underworld and demands that the gatekeeper open them. If thou open not the gate to let me enter. I will break the door. I will wrench the lock. I will smash the doorposts. I will force the doors. I will bring up the dead to eat the living, and the dead will outnumber the living. So she ain't messing around. Now the gatekeeper lets Ishtar into the underworld, opening one gate at a time. At each gate, Ishtar had to shed one article of clothing. Hello. When she finally passed the seventh gate, she was naked in a rage Ishtar threw herself at Erskel, but Erskel ordered her servant Namtar to imprison Ishtar and unleash 60 diseases against her. That's pretty wild. Now, here's the symbol. Here's one of the old Sumerian carvings of antiquity. Now, let me, let me read the Epic of Gilgamesh to you guys. Now, this is Tablet 6, and essentially it's Ishtar's proposal and rejection by Gilgamesh. She comes on to Gilgamesh, she offers him all sorts of opportunities, and he says, wait a second, you're the Black Widow. I don't want to get bit by poison, and she goes off. So, here we go. Ishtar's revenge, the bull of heaven, the slaughter of the bull, and Kidu's ominous dream. And Kidu, Enki, hmm. Maybe Gerald Clark was right, ladies and gentlemen. 
All right, here we go. The Epic of Gilgamesh, Tablet 6. Gilgamesh bathed himself and cleansed his hair. As beautiful as it was long, he cast off bloodied robes and put on his favorite gown, secured and cincture, and stood royal. Then Gilgamesh put on his crown. Ishtar looked up at Gilgamesh's handsome pride. Come to me, she whispered. Come to me and be my groom. Let me taste all parts of you. Hello. Treat you as husband. Be treated as your wife. And as a gift, I'd give to you one regal coach of gold and blue with wills of yellow, and also knew that I would flatter all your might with the sight of demons driven off by my own God, by my own man, come to my home, most sweetly scented of all places, where holy faces wash your feet with tears, as do the priests and priestesses of gods like Anu, almighty, hands-on kings and queens. We'll open doors for you, so too will all the countryside donate and duplicate to your fold, and the slow will race ahead of you, and the slow will race ahead for you, so that by association all that you touch will turn to gold. Gilgamesh replied to mighty Ishtar thus, But how could I repay you as a wife, and still avoid the bitterness and strife that follow you? It is perfume for a dress you want, or me? Is it perfume for a dress you want, or me? Myself or something wrapped around a tree? Do I offer you food, sweet nuts, or grapes? Are those for gods or for the savage apes? And who will pour a treat to us in bed? You're dressed for life, and me as, I, as if I'm dead. Here's a song I made for you. Ishtar's the hearth gone cold, a broken door without the gold, a fort that shuts its soldiers out, a water well that's filled with doubt. Tar that can't be washed away, a broken cup, stained and gray, rock that shatters to dust and sand, a useless weapon in the hand, and worse than that, or even this, a God's own sanded, a God's own sandal filled with piss. You have had your share of boys, that's true, but which of them came twice for you? Let me now list the ones that you just blew away. First was Tamaz, the virgin boy you took after a three-year-long seductive look. Then you lusted for a fancy-colored bird and cut its wing so it could not hurt. Thus in the lovely woods at night, birds sing, I'm blind, I have no sight. You trapped a lion too, back then. Its cock went in your form as hen, and then you dug him seven holes in which to fall on sharpened poles. You led a horse in your back door by laying on a stable floor, but then you built the world's first chain to choke his throat and end his reign. You let him run with all his might, as boys will sometimes do at night, before you harnessed his brute force with labor fierce, a mean divorce. So did his mother weep and well to see her child's foot set with a nail. You fondled once a shepherd boy who baked buns for your tongue's joy, and daily killed his lambs so coy. So in return for gifts like those, you choose to lupinize his toy. And when his brothers saw his penis, they knew you'd done something heinous. Heinous. <laughs> Whoa! Ishulanu trimmed your father's trees and brought you carrots, dates, and peas, so mighty you sat down to feasts. Then turned your thoughts to raping beasts. You saw him naked once and said, Come, Ishulanu, into my bed and force your force into my head. Place your fingers where men dread to touch a girl who's dead. And he in turn said this to you, What is it that you'd have me do? I know, kind mother, I won't eat if I can't match your female heat. But would you have me sing and sin as my whistle goes both out and in? So since he balked to play that role, you switched his jewel into a mole, stuck in the muck of a marshy town. His pleasure can't go up or down, 
and that is how you deal with me. If we got friendly, warm, and free, when Ishtar heard his words so cruel, she lost her cool and played the fool. Lou by blasting off for Daddy's distant star, where she said, Daddy, 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 please. Gilgamesh called me a tease. Gilgamesh said I sinned and lived without faith in myself or others. She pouted. Her father, Anu, said these exact words to Ishtar. Now, daughter, did you first insult him? This Gilgamesh who then began to taunt you with jibes about your inclinations. Ishtar shouted back at him, who is her father. You, now make him stop. Loose the bull who could trample him at once. Let the bull spill his blood, and you'd better do this now, or I'll wreak havoc of my own right down to hell. I'll loose the goddamn devil. I'll rain corpses. I'll make zombies eat infants, and there will be more dead souls than living ones. Her father Anu said these exact words to Ishtar. But if I do what you seem now to want, there would be long years of drought and sorrow. Have you stored enough reserve to feed the people who deserve your close protection? And she said, Yes, I have reserved a plan for those I love. Now do as I demand and punish all who insult me. Then her father Anu heard Ishtar's cry, and Ishtar forced her will. Anu set loose a bull from out of the sky, and at the bull's proclamation, there cracks the earth to swallow up nine dozen cities of Uruk. An earthquake fixed a grave for nine dozen cities of Uruk. Two or three or four hundred victims, maybe more than that, fell into hell. And when the quake returned for a third time, it was near to Enkidu. He who fell upon the abyss so wide and grim, Enkidu collapsed near the earth-shaking bull. Then he leaped to grab the bull by his long horns, even with spit upon his face from out the savage mouth, even with the stench of bowels near his nose. Then Enkidu said to Gilgamesh, Brother, you and I are now held as one. How could we defeat a god? Brother, I see a great challenge here, but we can dare defy such force. Let's kill it if we can right now. Be unrelenting and hope that God gives us the strength. We must be cold and strong to cut our enemy's weak neck. Enkidu surrounds the bull, pursuing heaven's beast, and finally catches him. So Gilgamesh, like a bull dancer, svelte and mighty then, plunged his sword into the throat held fast by Enkidu. They butchered and bled the bull, and then cut out its heart to offer as sacrifice for Shemesh. Then Gilgamesh and Enkidu retreated from the altar itself and stood afar in deep respect as they did pray. At last the two sat down, bound by war, bound by worship, Ishtar appeared upon Uruk's walls, looking like a wailing widow. She shrieked this curse aloud. Damn Gilgamesh who injured me by slaughtering a divine bull. And Kidu reacted to these words of Ishtar quick by hurling at her head a hunk of meat from the bull's thigh. And from afar he shouted up to her, This bloody mess of a plain bull would be about what I could make of you if I came near. I'd tie your hands with these rope-like intestines. Ishtar signaled then for her attendants. Coiffured bishops, cantors, and girls whose charms keep worshipping, whose charms keep worshippers coming. Then atop the great wall, above the city high, standing by the severed part of its right thigh. She had them shriek, laments for the bull who died. So to complete this ritual and adorn his throne, Gilgamesh summoned artisans of all kinds. Some measured the diameter of the bull's horns, each containing 30 pounds of lapis lazuli. Together those horns could hollow hold half a dozen quarts of oil. And that is what Gilgamesh brought as potion to the altar. 
of Lugula Banda, his special protector, he carried the horns and enshrined them in a palace of honor where his clan held rights. Then Enkidu and Gilgamesh absolved their bloody hands in the forgiving river, the deep eternal Euphrates that does not change. At last relieved of such a stain, the friends renew their vows with a brief embrace before riding through Uruk's crowded streets. Amid acclaim, there Gilgamesh stops to give his speech to gathered girls. What man is most impressive now? Who is the finest, firmest, and most fair? Isn't Gilgamesh that man above men? And isn't Enkidu the strongest of all? Then they party loudly throughout the day, so that come night they drop down dead in sleep. But Enkidu is resurrected quickly to relieve his soul of fright. And sadly, he asks Gilgamesh in tears, O oh brother, why would I dream that gods sat round to set my fate. Wow. I'll tell you, that is an extremely powerful poem. And to think of the age, how old this thing is, thousands and thousands of years old, could be even older than that. And the origins, the Anunnaki, the Anu, Enkidu, Gilgamesh, Ishtar, this is incredible, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to dive deeper into these texts of antiquity because I feel there's a lot of missing pieces and links to these scribes that have been suppressed and hidden and retranslated and altered. And one thing that I do notice in this poem is it seems very astrological. It seems to be talking about the stars a lot, in my opinion. Or do you think that this actually physically took place by these beings? Or maybe it was both, because as they say, as above, so below, in the heavens as it is down on earth. But when it talks about hell being opened up and the city of Uruk being, you know, people from Uruk being taken into hell, it sounds like an earthquake to me. And that makes me think about hell and the the abyss and the what you hear about constant burning maybe hell is actually the the rebirth of physical matter maybe that's why heaven as space and the stars maybe these stars are aligned in specific places as stargates for spiritual travel maybe that's why the pyramids are aligned towards specific star constellations and many mages and those in mystery schools would go into the apex of these pyramids at particular times. It could be like a projection. It could be um, a much more powerful way to astral project or have an out-of-body experience. I've had many OBEs and astral projection experiences. I can't even imagine what it would be like to be able to do something like that in the apex of the Cheops Pyramid, especially when it was at one point very refined and polished and it had the capstone maybe of gold who knows what the capstone was actually made of but now we're seeing the remnants of these incredible megaliths that are around the world even in places like japan underwater several hundred feet because the earth changes as we go along this is incredible folks i was really impressed when i read about the origins at least our particular take of the origins of easter now let's go even deeper with this if Ishtar is the way that she is described in this text and Easter is being worshipped, that seems dark in my opinion. That seems like the, the negative faction of energy. It seems very Darth Vader-like in my opinion. So with that said, that also makes me think about somebody that I talked to today that went to a mega church out here in San Antonio. And she was telling me about how there were several thousand people there. It was so busy that they had chairs out in the hallway. And there was 12, approximately 12 police officers steering traffic to get into the church. Church is big business. Think about that for a minute. If you have a mega church, you don't have to pay taxes. 
and people look at you like you're speaking of God's word, so they give you much more faith, blind faith, and have a lot more trust in you, oftentimes, because you are a church, and then think of all the industries that are tied to these churches. Well, my friend was also telling me about how a lot of the people that were there were dressed in their finest clothes. You know, think about all the money that goes into the clothes, the shoes, the jackets, the ties, everything. To go to a church, you got you know, they want you, oftentimes people feel like they need to dress up and meet a certain requirement and, and look as good as the Joneses next door and drive to church in their $750 a month car payment. Welcome to consumerism. You guys, listen to that text that I just read you. Go back and listen to it again. Read it. There's a really cool website called piney.com, and you can read about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Just type in Epic of Gilgamesh. It's Tablet 6. Read that, and then go into the aftermath of Ustra, the Anglo-Saxon, the Germanian god of Ishtar. This is deep. This is very deep. Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, another thing, too, I'm just throwing this out there. Gerald Clark wrote a book called The Seventh Planet Mercury Rising and the Anunnaki of Nibiru. And he has a pretty good analysis, a really good analysis on the Epic of Gilgamesh. And he does a really good job with his scroll because he's got a particular scroll that you can either get in digital format or get the vinyl scroll, which is what I've got on my um, wall here. You can see it sometimes when I do these shows. And he breaks down a lot of these different names and ties them to particular deities of the Anunnaki. Anu, the king of the Anunnaki. This is incredible, folks. I mean, this is like one of those aha moments for me, reading the Epic of Gilgamesh and tying that to Easter, Ishtar, Ustra. I've known for years about the the pagan fertility worship, uh, you know, and the, the bunnies popping out cute little eggs and stuff like that. And I also did some reading about that where... A long time ago, when they worshipped Ustra in places like Germany and other locations, they would take particular eggs and place them over graves of their ancestors as, uh, as a rite. Fascinating indeed. I hope that Ishtar is nicer now because she seemed pretty mean back then. So here's another thing that I want to say. People... Oftentimes, as they grow older, tend to calm down, relax a bit, don't have so much piss and vinegar in their system. Maybe it's the same with these gods, these incredible angelic beings, these deities that can live in perpetuity, possibly, in these physical bodies. And when I read about Enkidu being resurrected quickly in the Epic of Gilgamesh, that made me think of the stars in the heaven like, you know, the sun coming up in the morning. And it also made me think of the Cylons, how the consciousness of the Cylons can be re-uploaded into different bodies continually. Maybe it's the same for these entities. Maybe they got to the point, technologically speaking, some of the ways that a lot of people that are very intelligent here in the States or on this planet are working on ways to download their consciousness into computer systems and bodies, etc., some people believe that's a prison. Some people believe you can't do that. Some people firmly believe you can. Now, if you can break consciousness down into information, into ones and zeros, and if that's how the electric grid of life works through the, these ones and zeros, maybe you can. Maybe there's a third piece that you can't put into a machine. I don't know. We're biological machines. I hope to see you guys at the X-Fest event, South Dakota. Look up Fort Igloo on Google Maps if you'd like to attend, or just go to terravivos.com. You can RSVP at guestbookingsatleakproject.com. Now, use the code LEAKPROJECT23. Use the code LEAKPROJECT23. If you do purchase one of these awesome military-spec concrete steel bunkers, use the code LEAKPROJECT23. And you will also get your choice of either a solar generator, a wind generator, windmill, I should say, or a Berkey water system. 
Also, if you RSVP, you can stay in one of the bunkers for free. We're going to have some telescopes out there for a star party. There's not going to be a whole lot of artificial light out there. It's going to be a great place to look at the stars and the constellations. And, hey, maybe we'll find Planet X. Let's hope not. <laughs> also, if you become a premium member at leakproject.com, you'll get access to exclusive content. It's 50 bucks for the entire year. You have access to over 700 full-featured podcasts downloadable, and your contributions greatly help Leak Project. Also, I'm taking supplements from GetTheTea.com. I love their products. I've been taking these Essential Bees. I've been taking their D365 tabs and this stuff called Colostrum, and it is literally amazing. I feel like a billion-dollar bill. Priceless. Let's go to the priceless level, actually. All right, that was kind of cheesy. But anyway, get the tea.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Question everything. Ignorance is not bliss. And be the change you want to see.